join you again this year. So I think our third time joining you, this time virtually. I must say I prefer Calgary to uh, Plano, Texas. That is uh, the state of affairs uh, today. So hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, the presentation that I'm sharing with you is already available. Both Amy and Anthony have a copy, so please don't worry about the detail. Uh, that'll be available to you immediately after this uh, presentation. A few slides, really. I want to focus on the situation. Obviously, our industry is suffering. However, and I have to, uh, first of all, congratulate James for the, the uh, taking over the chair, but also echo his, uh, his uh, views on where this is going. We see quite a few green shoots, and we're going to reference that here in the presentation. So uh, bear with me as I, as I try to advance our screen and uh, make sure this is working properly. There we go. Here's a quick outline. Uh, really, uh, this is something uh, almost foundational for us in our analytics. We look at uh, the economy, always the economy, the operating environment of our industry. And then our survey, we have an ongoing survey of owners and operators. It's been going for, it'll be nine, uh, more than nine years now. And we have access to owner and operator opinions from across Canada and of course around the world. So right now we have over 19,000 respondents from 133 countries. It gives us quite a, quite a range of information and insights into what the customers are thinking in our industry. And ultimately that really is what it's all about, our customers. Okay, a little bit of uh, analytics here and hopefully you can see this for the purposes of uh, of uh, this uh, presentation. The things you're seeing on the screen here, the blue or in the Canadian case, red bar, refers to the number of business jets that are based in country. This is based on uh, the latest information in JetNet. So if, if any of you disagree with some of these numbers, just let me know and I'll make sure that uh, the databases are updated. But this is as of this week, uh, according to our database uh, at JetNet. Canada has around 530 base business jets the, the green line that you see snaking across your, your page, your screen, is the GDP growth outlook for 2020. Uh, in my, all my years and in all of your years, I'm sure, we've never seen a number, numbers like this, uh, especially so suddenly. This was supposed to be a good year. It started out that way. January, February actually looked pretty good uh, from all of the metrics we were tracking. Most of them were looking pretty good. Now suddenly minus 5.1% GDP growth in Canada. For people who don't understand what that means, that means a recession. Uh, we've already officially in the U.S. called a recession uh, beginning, I believe, in February. So this is a, a very sharp difference from even just a, a few months ago. Now, uh, that little note line you see staying across the page there, that dashed line, that's really, a, you know, 0% growth. Anything below that line is a recession. And, and you see it just across these top 20 countries. The U.S. doesn't show up on this chart. It's actually a very, very large fleet, and it sort of throws the graphic off. But uh, the U.S. right now is expected to shrink by around 3.8% uh, this year. And you see that here on this next screen. Uh, the green bars you see here, the green bars on your screen, this really refers to the, the level of GDP. It's based in the, or this is in U.S. dollars. So the higher, higher the bar, the larger the economy. And we see in the middle of your screen, I don't know if it'll, it'll work, but I'll point at it here with my pointer. We see the effect uh, 11 years ago now. How can we believe it? already 11 years ago when we saw the, the global financial crisis kicking in? What you see here, the blue line snaking across the page. So here's the blue line. That's red off the right side. That's the number of business jet cycles. So takeoffs and landings. And you see the hyper reaction, if you like, to the last time we had an economic downturn. That's U.S. data. Obviously, the U.S. is a big chunk of our industry, around 60% of based aircraft or based business jets are in the US. This year, 3.8 GDP uh, decline is the current outlook, which obviously is gonna bring down the, uh, the, the cycles outlook. And you see it had already flattened out, out here in the out years. So business jet cycles activity. Down below in the chart, you see the growth of the US fleet. Again, uh, just one indicator of, uh, of health in the market, very steady, slow growth of the fleet, very low retirements. These airplanes live and live and live and, and fly uh, for many, many years. The thing to point out though, is that we've seen uh, an increase in the fleet while cycles have been flat. And I think that's something that as we look forward, uh, we're gonna have to think about that as an industry. How do we get these airplanes flying more? And I think that's a real opportunity with commercial airline activity, its schedules really diminished. People are discovering uh, business aviation, perhaps like never before. Here's just a quick chart and you can study this. 
Uh, it just looks over time from 1998 and uh, to uh, last the end of last year in terms of both corporate profits and cycles, flight activity again. And you see there is not a, a linear relationship here at all. Uh, we, we put uh, on this chart some labels just so you understand how we look at this. You know, you might think of the uh, early 2000s, that's, uh, you know, 15, 16 years ago as kind of the good old days when, when there was a, a direct relationship, a correlation between flights and profits. You know, companies make money, you think they need to use airplanes. That seemed to be the relationship, you know, some years back before the global financial crisis. We've recovered since then, but at a lower level. And we can talk around that, and I'd be glad if you have any questions, detail, we'll take them here on the call, but also just email me and I'll, uh, I'll look forward to answering those for you. Now, here's some very, very recent data. This goes through June 15th, which I believe is two days ago. Uh, and some of the encouraging signs we're looking at, we have access to real-time FAA uh, data on uh, flight activity, and we categorize it here by, um, by operational uh, categories. So these are a bit different from in Canada. So uh, the Part 135, if you're not familiar with Part 135, that's essentially a charter type flight. Uh, part 91 is a private operation, non-commercial. And on the far right of your screen, fractional ownership programs like Air Sprint and others. And this is for US data, uh, for flights coming and going. Um, now the good news here, and we've categorized it by size category, a small jet is anything like a light jet or below. Medium jet is, uh, you know, super mid up to, uh, or super light up to, up to uh, super mid. And then large is large cabin like Challenger 600 series and above. Now you see the different reactions, if you like, to, to the crisis. Clearly, and I echo what we've already heard, we're starting to see a recovery out of the trough, which appears to have been in April, a very deep trough, uh, 75, 85% off in flight activity. These are US data, but it, it does reflect uh, one of the big markets we're all watching. By type of operation, at part 135, so-called charter on-demand flying is bouncing back. And look at that, it's only down 32 points year over year in the first half of June. These data are fresh, as fresh as we can get them. So, you know, part 91, that's the private ops, still down a little bit. And the 91K program uh, holders like uh, NetJets, uh, FlexJet, et cetera, suffering a little bit more than others, and uh, we're watching that. The good news is everything is recovering, and uh, it seems to be at a pretty steady pace. We are very concerned, of course, about any second wave uh, of infections and, of, of course, uh, fatality, fatalities, but uh, we'll see. Hopefully, we'll see um, some more progress like we're seeing on a vaccine. Here's some more busy data, but again, you can study this at your leisure. Just want to share it with the AGM because I think it's important. The blue line here that you're seeing, the blue line is transaction activity. That's the number of pre-owned aircraft, in this case, jets that are selling worldwide. And you see uh, to your right on the screen, we've seen a drop off. 18, 2018 was really a, a recent peak. We've seen seven of the last eight quarters. We've seen declining activity and declining sentiment. So. Um, you know, this isn't just uh, COVID, it's, it's a few other things going on. I think people were kind of geared and, and ready for uh, some sort of slowdown. We had factored it into our forecasts even at the end of last year. So we'll see where this goes. The red line, of course, is uh, inventory, the number of aircraft out there on the lot. So think of it as a used car lot. How many air airplanes are in this case? Yeah, airplanes are, are available for sale. When these lines cross, that starts to tell us a few things, like we saw way, way back in uh, 07, 08, and you see, I'll point to it if you can see my pointer. So we're all, obviously, we had signals of this coming, uh, but it's, you know, COVID is, is making it much, much, much more harsh. Did I say much more enough? Okay, transactions. This is something we watch a lot, pre-owned, why? Why do we look at pre-owned? Some analysts don't even look at this stuff. We look at utilization, we look at transactions, why? Because this gives us a real pulse of the market. What's going on now? not you know, six months later when the reports start rolling in. So here's transaction activity this year versus last year by uh, looking at the first five months of the year. 25 points, that's the gray bar on, the far, on your far right. We're down about 25 points in volume. Now most of that uh, you'll see here on the next slide uh, has occurred just in the last April, May kind of time frame, last eight weeks call it. And you see some of the numbers, uh, anything below the line is a decline year over year. So this is looking at 2020 activity versus the same month last year. Now you might go back and say, wow, what was going on in February? You know, mid, mid size aircraft were just selling like crazy. Mm, no, we don't. That's why we look at things over time and blend them. Yeah, that's, that's a point in, in time and 
something happened there. I'm not really sure what that is, but let's look at the bigger picture. And here where we are, uh, large cabin seems to be getting uh, hit a little bit harder than other classes. Why? Well, you know, with border shutdowns, quarantines, etc. No, no big surprise. These are the birds that, that fly long haul. And uh, that's where you're probably going to see the lower, lower activity or maybe even lower interest for some time. Business jet deliveries by manufacturer, by original equipment manufacturer, OEM. We use that expression a lot. This is it over time. Uh, the top of your bars here, this is the number of business jets that we're delivering. And you see the various mini cycles we've been looking at since this recovery began from the 09 uh, crisis, 08, 09. Last year, 720 jets, this excludes single engine Cirrus aircraft, which would have taken it to 800. So it's a good year last year. We saw a nice bump up in, uh, in, uh, in delivery units. And you can see it by OEM down here, some pretty good numbers. So far after Q1, pretty slow start for most OEMs. Bombardier had a very good uh, Q1, but of course Q2 has been tough, uh, a lot of furloughing, et cetera. So we're expecting this year's deliveries to be down around 30% year over year, so 720 take 30% off, you end up somewhere around 600 or so. That's where our forecast is. And uh, we've been very accurate actually with our, with our outlooks. Okay, let's, uh, let's go forward. Another thing again to factor in, it's a worldwide number, but these are the big players in our industry in terms of the manufacturers. Uh, full disclosure, we work with all of these people. They're great aircraft companies. Uh, and uh, this is the situation as we see it. So in terms of the backlog, these are orders that have been placed that are on firm contracts that, uh, that really uh, are sitting there to be delivered. And we see for the first time in 2019, we were watching this for a long, long time. And that was over a, a 10, long 10 year period. We finally saw backlogs increasing at the big OEMs. It had been a burn down, if you like, from the last, unbelievably from 2009, we've been burning backlog in our industry pretty regularly. And now, uh, unfortunately for the first few uh, months of this year, the first three at least, it looks like backlogs are down just a little bit. No big surprise, order activity is pretty slow. So we're sitting at around 32 billion US of backlog in the big five OEMs. Bombardier and uh, Tech and uh, Gulfstream are uh, enjoying most of that. Book to bill, what is that? That's the order activity uh, divided by, if you like, the, uh, the delivery activity. So a balanced book to bill of around one 0.0 to 1 means that our factories, or at least in this case, these five factories, five OEMs are balanced. So last year for the first time in, in really the whole period since the 09 crisis, the last crisis, we actually saw book to bills kind of hovering around one, in some cases a little bit above one. Uh, Embraer in particular had a very good year. Um, but I mean, here's here where we start with uh, in 2020, pretty early days, but so we're expecting book to bills to be well below one for the year. Uh, let's look at some specific data on Canada, and I think this is fascinating when uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, I grew up in Montreal and, and uh, lived in Toronto as well and been all across the country. One of the things that I didn't realize about uh, the fleet in Canada until I really started studying some of this is really how unique it is, how different it is from, let's say, the U.S. And, and uh, I know growing up in Canada, you, you live next to the U.S. and you're sort of, you know, always wondering, you know, how do we look compared to the, how the way... Uh, that fleet looks like. So look, look, look at this chart. Around three quarters of the fleet, the business jet and business turboprop fleet in Canada are really, they're, they're on the light end of the spectrum. They're either a turboprop uh, or a, a light jet. In this case, the purple and, and red colors you see on your screen on the left. On the right side, we see the US fleet where you see some significant differences, much fewer turboprops and a larger light jet fleet. So at this, you know, you tally it all up, around 70% of both uh, markets, if you like, are light and, and turboprop airplanes. But uh, you know, Canada has a very different mix. One of the things we like about this chart for the Canadian situation is the turboprop activity and certainly light jet activity is the strongest in the market right now. We, we did not see the, the, you know, the, the very low level of flight activity uh, happening really in those segments. It dropped, sure but it's actually more robust than, uh, than others. So actually that's a good news uh, picture for Canada. Just quickly here, I'll focus on some of the survey information. We have an ongoing survey of the owner and operator community. Appreciate uh, all of those folks across Canada who participate with us. And we, we've picked up around 100 responses from Canadian uh, uh, organizations in the last uh, year or so. We'll share with you some of those results.
Our distribution of, of respondents is very much like the world fleet, and this has been going on for uh, almost nine, a little over nine years. What kind of airplanes are on the uh, radar for the Canadian uh, uh, owners and operators? Very interesting and very different from uh, people uh, looking at airplanes south of the border. Look at this uh, King Air Challenger. The perennial favorites are up here on the board, of course. Um, but the turboprop uh, PC-12 and, and certainly the uh, now the PC-24 from Pilatus, very interesting. These are showing up on the radar also in other parts of the world. But Pilatus as a relatively small manufacturer is starting to really make a name for itself. Honda Jet as well, this is interesting. Uh, they've been uh, trying to penetrate more and more of the market uh, worldwide with their very innovative uh, Honda Jet, and now we're starting to see it show up on the radar, at least of Canadian owners and operators interested in this aircraft. Challenger 350, as I said, mentioned, and I mentioned, and I'll mention again, just a perennial favorite. It does so many things so well, and Bombardier is a real winner there. King Air 350, very, very solid airplane without really a direct competitor worldwide and continues to be in demand. So those are what uh, airplanes that are really on the radar. So if you're buying, selling, uh, producing any of these aircraft, you know, the, look for the look for the phones to be ringing. Let's look at the U.S. situation. A little bit different. The Challenger 350 again showing up very strongly. This airplane, I mean, whoever uh, was responsible for it, I'm, I'm kidding, but uh, Bombardier's got a real winner here. Uh, really solid design's been kept fresh for for years. This is the winner uh, of, in volume in many ways. Below that, look at some of these other airplanes, the G550 Gulfstream, very popular in, in, in Canada and other markets, of course, but it's still on the radar. The airplane will probably uh, be coming out of production at some point in the next couple of years as, as uh, Gulfstream uh, transitions to their new aircraft. But look at that, demand is still there. These are both pre-owned and new uh, airplane of, of interest. Falcon 2000, a, a beautiful airplane, well-designed, very efficient, and uh, you know Falcon is gonna do well with that airplane. Uh, in the U.S. for sure going forward. Pilatus again showing up and as well as Citation. Okay, what are some of the things that are that are on people's minds, especially in Canada, where we, we think about, okay, you know, are you looking at an airplane in the next 12 months and what, oh, uh, Mr. or Ms. Uh, owner operator, what might delay that decision? Now, this goes back over the last four quarters of surveys. So this data is as fresh as can be. And we asked Canadian respondents, Okay, what's, what might hold up your next purchase? Again, pretty important in, in insights to have. In Canada, the primary thing, and we see this again and again, well, I have enough aircraft in my fleet. I really am not in the buying mode. And if you think of it, if an airplane lives with an owner for five or more years, that's gonna typically show up again and again as a primary concern. I, I, you know, I, have, enough, I have enough aircraft. But look at some of the other things that, uh, that are on the, the radar. Obviously the decline in activities, you know, my business is just, you know, kind of flat or, or maybe down. I don't know what's going on with this economy or the regulations that may be thrown our way. Maybe there's an issue re regarding trade-ins and, and, you know, I might not be able to sell my airplane as well as, as I like. We know uh, end user demand is down. Just shows some other data there for the U.S. just from a reference point of view. Now, I know there are some people on the call, at least I hope so, who are in the financing business. It's a good business to be in. Um, of course, uh, a lot of folks look to financiers, lenders, lessors to help them with that purchase and, and get an airplane uh, on their ramp. So here, again, just some differences in opinion as to what people are thinking around for, for their next aircraft purchase. In this case, uh, uh, new airplanes. How are you expecting to finance that airplane? And in some cases, it's cash. We know cash is, is important in this market. But you see some of the other alternatives as well. And again, we contrast that with the US. Cash may be used at the transaction point of sale, but uh, going forward, it's quite often that uh, uh, maybe it was easy to get, easier to get out of town after you, you, know, you made the transaction, but you really wanted to finance the airplane and didn't want any further delays getting out of the completion center. So operating leases, interestingly enough, uh, 10, 12, 13% of the market appears to be an operating lease uh, market. On pre-owned, a little bit different and uh, very some interesting distinctions with Canadian and US situations. Again, this is a plan. This isn't necessarily happened, but it's what they're thinking of doing for that next airplane purchase, in this case, pre-owned. And you see uh, maybe some additional participation of the banks and less, lessors, lessors in, in Canada in terms of uh, 
participating in the pre-owned market, a little bit less interest on that side of things in the US. Now, uh, any lender, lessor, owner, operator, they're gonna be interested in, in residual values. They're investing a lot of air, uh, money in that aircraft. They wanna know what's, you know what, what's the outlook for residuals. Well, clearly in a soft end user demand market, we're gonna see softening there in terms of residuals. And we're seeing that here in this chart. We asked owners and operators, hey, over that, uh, and this is from Q2, you see down here the reference, our very, very recently finished survey in Q2 2020, just uh, around a week ago. Do you agree or disagree? Is that airplane, that five-year-old airplane, is it gonna, is it gonna decline in value? And they, you know, anything blue here means yeah, and red means no, they don't think so. So quite a, quite a uh, there is some concern here for sure. Residuals are, are on the decline. Here's some interesting information. We call it the net promoter score, of course. It's well known and well regarded as a typical metric used for really a, a, as a measure of satisfaction. If you sold something, would somebody recommend it if you like to a friend or colleague? And in this case, <laughs> the, the idea isn't selling, it's really a career. Would you, uh, would you join this industry? Uh, would you recommend joining this industry as a career? Uh, my father was in the industry and I know maybe many people on this call had the same experience where you know, we, we got into it because it, it was just close to us at, at some point in time. For, for many of us, that, that creates a career path. Uh, a net promoter score, anything above one, uh, zero is considered very good and uh, anything above 50 is considered outstanding. So the overall NPS, if you like, is 27, a pretty good score. And if you tally all this up, around three quarters of the people who we speak to, the owners and operators in Canada, are pretty optimistic about our industry, uh, you know, scoring an eight, nine or 10 uh, on, on 10 in terms of, yeah, this is a good place to work. Now things change, you know, right now uh, we're in a bit of a furlough situation, uh, this will pass. Here's our current outlook for the forecast. Um, we've taken our forecast down primarily in this sort of short term. This is new airplane deliveries worldwide by size category. We had originally thought we'd be running uh, around this year at around 725 or so units. We've taken that down to just, uh, and you see it on this chart, uh, somewhere below 600. So. That's just the outlook. We think it kind of flattens out and then really we get a nice uptick after we get through some of the next little period in time. The OEMs, it's a little bit of a different world. Uh, the supply chains, once you slow them down, they're a little bit harder to ramp up, as you know. So uh, the recovery of cycles, the recovery of transactions and pre-owned aircraft is gonna be much faster than this. In the world of OEMs where the, the manufacturers are, are living, we, uh, we think there's gonna be some transitions, older airplanes coming out of uh, production and newer ones ramping up. And uh, in this out year, we're the first to really forecast uh, the, a new supersonic category of aircraft coming onto the uh, horizon here very shortly. So in terms of an, an outlook for, for business jet deliveries, we do a lot of forecasting and our forecasts have been very accurate. We have uh, a little over 6,300 jets going into the market in the next 10 years, a um, bunch of delivery, matched by some uh, acceleration of retirements as well. And uh, back-end loaded, we think the forecast here uh, is back-end loaded for good reason. And you see some of the money that's uh, expected to be spent just on new airplanes, new jets in this case, uh, a little over $200 billion. So it's a very healthy market. Uh, a lot of people are really, really uh, eager to get in an airplane, maybe their first uh, aircraft going forward, and uh, we, we look forward to it. So as I said, to summarize, um, uh, a bounce back in, in, in flight operations is already occurring. On demand is happening first. That's, that's very good news. People are maybe looking at, at our industry for the first time. We have a good image, uh, thanks to a lot of uh, hard work at CBAA, NBAA, and all of the uh, alphabet groups around the industry. I, I'm encouraged. We're gonna go through a bit of a flat period and uh, you know, look forward to your questions. I hope that was helpful. Fantastic, really. That was uh, that was excellent. Um, I know that uh, you know very quickly. I'm going to read off Isen Monfred with YYZ Law and Escrow Air uh, validated what you mentioned about some of the financing and in, in effect Canadian banks continuing to participate in finance and lease, whereas U.S. institutions are backing away. Three things that I kind of wanted to unpack, and I'd certainly remind everyone that uh, questions can come up in the chat now. But I really wanted to kind of explore a little bit more um, some of the reasons that you see uh, a stat that stood out to me when you compared U.S. and Canadian uh, decline in business activity as a survey response. In Canada, it was number two. In the USA, number four. 
I, do you want to expand a little bit on that? I know from our association standpoint, this is some of the initiatives we push, especially like the, you know, the pushing back against the luxury tax that was proposed. It's these kinds of elements that impact businesses. So can you perhaps expand a little bit more on sort of what you see are the differences between the Canadian score and the U.S. score in that sense? Yeah, I'd have to speculate a little bit there, Anthony. I'm, um, you know, I've lived on both sides of the border for many years, so I kind of grew up around some of these topics. I've done a lot of work in, in economics and geography as well. The, there's quite a distinction between the two countries when it comes to uh, the, the structural differences. The oil patch, Canada, despite all of the great technology coming out of many parts of the country, is still very much uh, resource dependent. So you've got commodity prices have been hit hard, oil prices, you know, had an entire collapse recently. A lot of folks in those sectors buy a lot of airplanes and fly a lot of airplanes. So you're going to see a little bit of a difference there, I think, based on more structural topics. Um, the, uh, there's maybe a little bit of a difference. I, I see a lot in some corners of Canada that I see in the U.S. as well. You know, the entrepreneurial nature. Folks who are entrepreneurial in, in general tend to have a little bit more uh, optimistic view of recoveries and things like that. We see a little bit more, I would say, uh, entrepreneurialism here, maybe a little bit more private sector uh, uh, investment here than we see north of the border. I mean, that, that's a very general uh, comment, but uh, I, I think that's a factor as well. So commodities, weak, um, a weak currency relative to the US. I mean, we, that's not just a Canadian phenomenon. Uh, you know, if you're in uh, Southeast Asia, you're, you're wondering uh, around, you know, things like that as well. Commodity prices, uh, currency relative to the U.S. The airplanes are transacted in U.S. whether we like it or not. That just seems to be the way of the world so, uh, so far until we have a new currency. <laughs> so then maybe, uh, you know, another follow-up would be the idea of data science. <clears throat> Given that we've got, um, got you here, a question that I always love to ask when folks are embedded as you are with the finger on the pulse of the data. Is there something that you see in the data that uh, you think is of interest that the industry itself isn't talking about? Um, is it something that you, you see as a trend that's developing, a concern that we should be paying attention to? Anything that jumps to mind when, uh, when you think of that? Uh, yeah, all, 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 all the time. I mean, I wake up sometimes like, oh my God, what did we just learn? You know, we, we have access to some amazing data that no one else has bothered to ask the owners and operators for so we, we, we have this pulse on the market it's amazing so one of the things that we're watching very carefully is uh, and you know it may come as a bit of a surprise to you but sustainability our our markets our uh, our um, uh, our customers our owners and operators sustainability is an issue going forward and I think it's a real opportunity as we reset as an industry going forward yeah there's going to be scrutiny on our public image um, all of that sort of thing. We have a good story, actually, when you look at how technology has been brought to, to bear to really improve our, our environmental footprint. Uh, Canadians are, are very sensitive to this topic. I see a lot of good um, energy in that, <laughs> good energy, good clean energy in that world, and, uh, and, and there's more to be done for sure. Our airplanes tend to be very efficient, but there's a lot more we can do. You know, getting sustainable aviation fuels into the field is, it's, it seems like, you know, oh yeah, we talked about that last year and uh, everything now is about COVID. We better not allow COVID to just take over every uh, headline and every moment and brain cell we have because we have businesses to run, we have people to move and, and the airlines are not gonna, gonna be doing uh, the job that they have tried to do for us for years. So uh, this is a dramatic opportunity for business aviation to really step forward and, and to really show what we can do. Appreciate that. Building on that, James uh, from Air Sprint asked the question, will you be watching Canada versus U.S. flight activity uh, separately over the next few months? When, of course, he's highlighting that the Canadian quarantine requirements are being substantially different from the U.S., which is a bone of contention we have for sure. And it's proving to be prohibitive for Canadians to travel to the U.S., which, of course, is a large portion of our Canadian flying. So I guess the primary question Will you continue to update and track the differences between U.S. and, in this case, Canadian flight activity? Well, absolutely. We have real-time data coming in off of ADSB uh, signal tower. We, uh, we have actually at JetNet, so we we can monitor a lot of different things, and it's amazing the analytics you can do with this. Um, 
companies that are doing it already uh, are watching the things that are more important to them. But uh, Canada U.S. traffic is a huge uh, op opportunity. Obviously, a lot of north south traffic coming in and out of for, for business and and personal reasons. It's an important market, and um, I think you know when you look at the Canadian GDP, around what is it, sixty percent is 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 geared to trade, international trade. U.S. much, much less so. Uh, but uh, there's nobody I know in in, uh, in the U.S. that doesn't want an open border with Canada. So uh, the friendliness and the the heritage of uh, you know goodwill and camaraderie and, and business relations really goes on. And and we all look forward to having that border open again. I, I you know, I, I've I've been in Canada usually six, seven times a year uh, and this year so far uh, the number is zero so uh, I look forward to it myself personally. <laughs> That's great maybe the last uh, question at least from my side that I identified I love NPS net promoter score and I thought maybe you could expand on it more I know you you, you spoke of it in the context of surveying um, career uh, goals in other words who would promote that uh, who are neutral but perhaps you could expand on that for those that maybe aren't as familiar with NPS uh, I think it's a fantastic trend. Um, so perhaps if you could expand a little bit more on NPS and what it means to our industry. NPS is uh, essentially, let's say you're my best friend or, or colleague and um, you, you're coming to me for a recommendation. Maybe it's an airplane, maybe it's, it's a community you want to live in, maybe it's a vacation home you want to buy. Uh, you might come to me as an experienced person and say, hey, you know, uh, would you recommend it? So on a scale of zero to 10, zero means hell no. 10 means absolutely. Uh, if you score a 9 or 10 on 10 on anything like this, it's considered a so-called promoter. What does that mean? It means I'm likely to go out and tell anybody uh, who asks, or maybe even those who don't ask, uh, about that brand or that uh, community or that airplane or that, you know, whatever experience that I had. If I score 7 or 8 on 10, sounds like a pretty good score, right? But actually, those are considered the neutral folks. They were, you know, satisfied but not delighted. And if you score zero to six, you're called a detractor, meaning, and this is, you know, science that's been used in all kinds of industries. Uh, zero to six is a detractor, meaning, you know what? Not only am I dissatisfied with something, but I may be so dissatisfied that I'm going to tell somebody, you know, the 28 people that I tell who are never going to join that golf course or, or buy that, you know, airplane or whatever. So a 9-10 score on 10 is an, uh, considered, a, you know, someone who is almost evangelical. You want those people. And the ratio of the nine tens to the zero sixes is considered the NPS. So anything above zero is a positive, a good score. Uh, we've seen one of the OEMs, and I don't think I'll mention who they are, but uh, they're off the scale. They're, they're scoring right now uh, almost 80 on, on an NPS mm -hmm. score. And if you want, I, I'll talk to you offline about it. Um, but all of our OEMs that we're tracking are in the 30 range or higher. And they go up to 80. So there's quite a, quite a score difference. And, uh, you know, a testament to our industry, uh, the engineering, the design, the quality, the service, aftermarket and before market. I mean, it's just, uh, we, we rock as an industry. That's great feedback. You know, it's it, especially highlighting that distinction of that 80 NPS. You know, I, I always used to like to say that you need your IQ, EQ, and LQ. And as, a, as an organization and a leadership function, if you can blend those three and understand what they mean and how they influence, in this case, NPS score, it's important. I will turn to perhaps two questions. We still have about three minutes of time. Nolan with KIP Creating, an associate member. Other than aircraft utilization, how do you see the MRO, AMO market being affected in Canada now that all these business jets have been down for maintenance over the last three months. So perhaps some words on MRO and AMO in Canada. I think those are key markets. In fact, we, we prior to the uh, downturn and, 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 and as it really kicked in, we were asking owners and operators to give us their perspectives on MRO. Are they going to look at you know, discretionary upgrades or, or you know, that heavy maintenance maybe they've been putting off? And uh, absolutely, I mean, it should be a relatively strong time for MRO activity in Canada for sure. And there's an advantage. I mean, if you have a part 145 type operation, if you can bring a work in from over the borders or, 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 or obviously, a, you know, have a, some sort of ability to access even beyond your home market, it's a good time. I mean, the dollar is, is attractive and the talent is, is impressive. So there you go. I mean, uh, go out and get it. Uh, now, clearly the border opening, there's another example of, hey, can we get this border back open so we can start bringing uh, work in where it should be? And uh, 
And I think Canada has a very, very good reputation, both across this border that we live across, but also internationally for, for doing the right thing and for also uh, providing uh, you know, high quality work at, at uh, good value. So MRO and, and CAMO or a, uh, AMO, aircraft management we think is, is a big, big part of the future. Uh, more and more companies are going to get to the point where they need an expert and they know they need an expert. Uh, they trust someone to operate the aircraft, to, to schedule it, to crew it, to maintain it, to keep all that. Remember the paperwork? <laughs> There's so much paperwork in this industry. Um, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's a growth area. So we like, we like charter going forward, we like fractional going forward. We like uh, MRO and we sure like FBOs as well. Uh, you know, private air terminals, it's part of the future. I think uh, I, I don't really uh, relish the idea of getting in another commercial airline terminal. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to do that, actually. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Perhaps with the time, one last question. Um, it builds a little bit on some of the stats you were seeing with the charter work, but uh, Scott Harold asks, uh, the growth of USA fractional private aviation, aviation, the growth in the U.S., do you see that sector of aviation steadily growing before the 91 or in Canada, the 604 category? So what's your thoughts on fractional uh, and, and the growth according to Scott? Well, we're watching that. I mean, this has been a, a, a great way to fly. I mean, fractional programs and fractional service levels. I worked at FlexJet for a few years and I, I got to know all of the players. I got to meet James and others. I mean, it's just, it's an industry full of quality. And, and I think as people discover that, hey, you know, I don't need or don't want to actually have my own airplane. It makes a lot of sense to be in some sort of program where things are professionally maintained, professionally flown uh, and, and, you know, in our complex lives, uh, I just, I can't see anything but growth for both charter, fractional, and, and other programs like, uh, you know, uh, aircraft management in particular, where you've got a trusted expert who you can turn to, and, you know, they've got the keys to the airplane, but, you know, you've got the phone, and you can tell them what you want to do with your airplane. So, I, I like, I like all of those sectors going forward, and uh, maybe you can see in the background here, that I wish I had one of these as my own, but I don't have one yet. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it, Roly. On behalf of uh, both the association and our members and the participants on this call, uh, hearing that perspective, getting an update about business aviation, um, it's, it's been fantastic. I think we would all agree that the trends that you've shown kind of lead us in the direction that we're all feeling now, which is that we've, we've, we've entered this pent-up demand phase. We know that the new normal of aviation, whatever that sense is going to, business aviation is going to play an important role. So thanks to you for taking the time out of your day to join with us and share that message. Thanks, Anthony, for having me. Uh, appreciate you and uh, congratulations to your team on all the work that you're doing. Very impressive.